colleagues, benvinguts, bon dia, good afternoon, welcome. It's enormous for me, it's almost weird, right, Reinhardt, to be with real people in a real room. It's actually the first one, I think, or the second one I do that, so it's really spectacular, it's so beautiful to be able to see each other, to be able to be in Barcelona, actually in my own city, although I'm not based here, and to be able to do all this wonderful networking that the, the International Hospital Federation has put us together. I hope I hope this uh, session here live, as well as virtually, will justify even further how useful it is for you to have uh, spent this opportunity cost of doing other things and be in Barcelona today and be with us today. My name is Joseph Figueras. I'm the director of the European Observatory. And today what we want to do with you, oh, I have already the first uh, uh, slide. I'm a bit uh, the warm-up. You know, when you go to a concert, you have the warm-up guy, you know, that uh, introduces things, introduces a bit, but the real stars are sitting over there, and another star will be joining us uh, over a video. So what we'd like to do today is reflect on all these innovations. I don't want to say the, the Churchillian sort of words about never waste a good crisis, because I'm a bit sick of this, of this sentence. We use it too much. But we have learned things. The hard way, but we have learned things. We have a, a range of innovations that we put in place in our hospital systems in record time. And when I say innovations, I'm not talking about technological innovations only. I'm talking as much as organizational innovations. What we'd like to do with today is how do we harness those innovations to build back better? What have we learned of those? So in my presentation, I'll give you a shopping list which my colleagues will go in more detail, of some of these innovations. I'll get you voting about them, so please go into your apps, please, 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 help us by voting which one you think is the most important one, and go into your apps as well, please, to, to, to raise questions that they will be addressing with the presenters and a round table afterwards. So the question is, what do we think are the innovations that we saw during the crisis? And more importantly, what can we learn about harnessing sustaining them, and what we learn about the implementation of innovation, which to me is the one million dollar question to implement, to transform health systems and implement innovation. Oops. Just a bit of self-marketing, but it's really good stuff, so sorry about that. This is a number of studies that we put in place to look at resilience of health systems. In, in uh, the last volume, the one on the, your right-hand side, uh, I think it's your right-hand side, yes, the right-hand side is, is the one we're launching the 15th. The 16th, there's a webinar where we're launching that with the WHO and the European Commission. And it's a detailed analysis of the health system resilience strategies, 20 of those that we looked across countries with best practice and so on. I'm not going to submit you to read all of them. Don't worry. This is just a reminder. What I'd really like today to do is this concept, how we implement and harness those innovations. Now, let me tell you, in our humble perspective, what we think are some of the key innovations in the hospital system. And again, I repeat, my much more learned colleagues are going to talk on that in detail. First, creating and repurposing and redistributing capacity and hospital beds. It's been fascinated, the ability of hospitals to reorganize, to create new wards, to coordinate with each other, Increasing uh, ICU capacity, Ran Habus is going to be talking about that. I'm not going to mention anything. Creating temporary hospitals. I'm not as interested. I'm interested about the new beds. I'm interested how to do them. But I'm interested, no, I'm interested in how to do them, at the process. How did we manage to do so much so quickly? And there's a question there that Reinhardt has already, uh, by surprise, uh, to some ways, but by design. Reinhardt. Is the spare bed capacity in Germany, you're going to answer that later, a, an asset or an efficiency? And there's huge, this is really the $1 million question today. Next one, really interesting ways in which we've been collaborating with the private sector. Tapping resources. Perhaps those of you in the other continent across the pond, it's not a big deal because most of you are private sector, but at this end of this pond in the European region, Working across the public and private sector is one of the issues we've been struggling. We've seen 14 WJ Euro counties we've been looking at, how this has, collaboration has been taking place very effectively. 
So are we talking about, as a reflection, a new paradigm with the private sector, how to use both public and private networks of hospitals more effective, effectively? Resistivity in patients across facilities, regions, and national borders. We've seen a lot of cross-border transfer. For us in this region, uh, a real show of European Union solidarity. Uh, Germany received patients from France, the Netherlands, and Italy. We have all the numbers on that if you're interested. We'll be publishing soon. But also real coordination and integration between hospitals that sometimes were competing. I'd like Mark later on to reflect on that how we've seen this real horizontal coordination uh, between, between, between hospitals. So are we talking from competition to collaboration? Is that a new paradigm? More, more in my long uh, shopping list, but it's just to get your juices, your intellectual juices running and preparing for the vote later. Real, this is only possible, we'll hear from Lisa Maria, thanks to real-time data systems on capacity for effective redistribution of resources. So those countries we had pre-existing monitoring systems were at an advantage. I mentioned already ICU registers in Finland, Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, UK. The ability to quickly redistribute patients to have these data systems has been fundamental. Again, no rocket science. No rocket science. Why so many countries do not still have them? Why do they don't know what the spare capacity ICU are there or other beds in other hospitals? Not only for cases of crisis, but in cases to collaborate and working together better. We cannot uh, uh, forget the important role of primary health care to, to support these hospitals, ensuring that those patients could be, that could be in the community, a state in the community, and not overwhelm the hospital beds. I'm moving quickly because my time is going quickly, and I made a point to do that in 10 minutes. Another important area, we've seen a really fast track access to diagnostic and, and treatment information, fast-track development and adoption of guidelines, professional bodies involved. Again, this concept that I'm fascinated about, horizontal collaboration between hospitals without having to go through hierarchies directly, sharing best, ex best experience on new treatments, on new diagnostics, working together with fast-track guidelines. Do you realize the potential in innovation if we continue doing that in other areas? why hospitals are not working across more effectively. Training innovations. Uh, one example of this step-up role of horizontal collaboration in this part of the world is the European reference networks. In the European Union, we have these hospitals in different member states. Many of them are represented here. I saw colleagues, CEOs from these hospitals that are working on, on rare diseases. It's a beautiful example of European Union countries coming together in rare diseases trying to get what you all want, the volume outcome. So these hospitals are working together with guidelines, best practices, virtual traveling of patients. Patients don't travel, but then a hospital in one country consults a hospital in another country where there's particular expertise on that particular rare disease. Why are we not applying that into other areas? A scaling up and uh, uh, the use of digital health in delivery Nick Fach is going to be talking in detail about that. He has been doing lead, uh, really seminal work in this area. What we've seen, to warm up you up a bit, is a massive increase on remote management and consultation. France, 24th increase in teleconsultation, for instance, within three months. So the innovation is not digital. The innovation is not digital. The innovation is the implementation of existing technological innovations. An easy, an easy play of words here. But that's the real innovation. How did we step up the use of these digital tools so quickly and effectively? One thirty-one minute and a half left. New models of financial hospital care. We were not going to touch on this one like many of the others today, because there's no time. But uh, again, not have time, we can do that in the debate if you want. I'm sure Mark Nopi here today has a lot of experience, actually, uh, Belgium and other countries. The INAMI, the, the health insurer there, changed immediately, quite quickly, I would say, Mark, maybe you will disagree, quite quickly the ways to pay for innovations, to pay for the different makeup that you have with COVID. We managed to change payment systems within weeks. We actually work, work with a number of countries, the observatory, to try to look at new payment systems to adapt to the new needs. 
How we harness that ability? Getting there. Last one. Again, in this case, Dimi Pantel is going to be talking about that, my colleague Dimi, about innovations in supporting and mobilizing the health workforce. If I had to choose one, I'm really fascinated about that one. For how many years we have evidence on different skill mix in hospitals? The role of assistant nurses, nurses practitioners, the role of other professionals, the role of technicians that I take in the lead of, from many of the doctors in doing many of, the, of, the, of, of the, the, the technical explorations. Why it took a crisis to see real teams, you remember those pictures of real teams of different doctors, nurses, different professions working together, taking different roles. Anyway, I don't want to steal the thunder from you, you're going to talk about that, Dimi. Uh, but just to say that, can we harness this innovation? How can we continue supporting? It's not enough to clap on the windows during the crisis. What has happened with these professionals? Dim is going to tell you about the kinds of things we can do for those professionals. Now is the time to vote, with a bit of frustration, but the idea of the vote, you have them in your apps, please do vote for me. Don't leave me here in the cold. It's very embarrassing if I only see five people voting there. It's really embarrassing. So please go into your app and choose. It's really tricky, I must confess. We, you were supposed to choose three, but the app didn't allow to choose three, you can only kind of choose one. But life is like that. If I give you now $10 million, $10 million euros, whatever currency you want, well, it makes a difference, which one would you put your money of those, okay? And what I want, please, with me, with us, reflect on these different innovations and which ones you think are the most important. You have to go to the app and vote from there. Maybe, Patricia, we can get, uh, or colleagues, we can get a slide showing how you go to the app. I don't remember by heart. And you can see, uh, but it is in your app. It is there you can vote. If someone cannot just scream, let me know. We'll find a solution. Otherwise, I'll ask my colleagues to explain. It's there. Are people voting? Please vote. Vote. Don't leave me alone here. I, I'm, I'm trying to make a bit of a clown here. I know. I'm a bit of a clown. But really, it's important that we, we try to reflect together. This is. This is why we need to take policymakers. We need to tell policymakers where they put the limited resources, what we want to support and strengthen in terms of innovations in our health systems. Perhaps, uh, I know it's 10, it's a long one. Uh, Ranjar is looking very carefully. Ranjar, do you have your vote? Will you share your vote? Later on, I'll ask you your, your secret vote. Yeah. I know what you're going to vote, though. I know what you, each one of you is going to vote. For, I know, I don't know about Mark, though, <laughs> or Lisa Maria. But I'll ask you, it's not going to be a secret for you, okay? Can I have the results, please? Okay, I need to get close to there and give my back to the camera. Oh, no, I can't go there. Yes. Okay. Implementing real-time uh, data monitoring systems, yeah, is getting together with developing alternative and flexible patient care pathways. Nick, I was hoping that, I was thinking that digital would be the one. At, uh, that, that's nice, quite, quite a spread here. Implementing digital health innovations with data monitoring systems and alternative uh, flexible care pathways seems to be the, uh, the key. But there's also uh, adopting alternative and flexible workforce skills. Good, Dimi. Good, Dimi. You're there. Coordination and integration across hospitals. Like that, that's my favorite. Thank you very much for supporting that one. I'm mobilizing and supporting the workforce as well. Anyway, this is just an opportunity to get a sense of what people think in the room. I shouldn't take more of my time. I'm going over my time and invite my good friend, uh, someone I respect very much, Raiha Busse, which has a fascinating presentation about beds, about beds during the crisis, about the lessons during the crisis. He's director of the TUB, uh, Technology of Berlin, Department for Health Policy and Management. Thank you very much, uh, Reinhard, for being here today with us. Yes, thank you, Joseph. <laughs> and welcome. As Joseph said, I'm leading a department of healthcare management at the Berlin University of Technology, and I'm one of the co-directors of the European Observatory. And the idea here is to look at the topic of creating and managing hospital beds. And clearly we all, we all say we need to learn something from the crisis. Let's harness the, 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 the innovations. Everybody says, yeah, let's, let's learn from it. But it's also important to realize, to get a sense 
of where countries have been and what has happened because things ha were slightly different from country to country. And I will explore a bit how these differences uh, play out. There were at the beginning of the crisis, and I think we all remember that the, the pictures from, from Bergamo and, um, and, and how and all policymakers in all of our countries, not only in Europe, I focus on Europe, but in, in the rest of the, of the world, um, had these common concerns at the beginning. How many cases will we have to be treated? How do we treat them? Do we treat them in, in hospital? Uh, or do we keep them out of hospital? Do we have enough hospital beds, especially ICU ventilation beds? And I remember when the crisis started, the boss of the German Robert Koch Institute called me and said, Professor Busse, do you know how many, how many ventilators we have in Germany? And I said, you are the, you are the boss of the Public Health Institute. And, but I mean, so we figured we had no idea. Nobody in Germany knew how many vent ventilators we actually had. Do we have in, in, in enough staff to do so? And how can we increase the number of beds and possibly also staff? And the stars, and these common concerns were in spite of very, very different starting positions. So this is a number of acute hospital beds in the various European countries. And you see that differs from 602 in my own country, Germany, per 100,000 population, down to 204 in Sweden by a factor of three. If we look at, at intensive care beds only, and clearly, leaving the question alone, what is an, an intensive care bed? Does an intensive care bed only count as an intensive care bed if you have a ventilator? Or what, what kind of beds count? We see even a factor eight difference between 34 in Germany and four in, in Malta. But independent from this starting level, all countries started to set up surge capacity. And I'm only looking here at the I ICU capacities. Probably the most astonishing thing in Malta, which uh, increased their number by 400% to, to fivefold. But also other countries managed to increase their ICU beds by more than 100, by more than 100%, with a slightly lower percentage on the right-hand side. But even us, we said we need more beds. I come back to, to, to that in a few minutes until we realize we also need personnel to, to, to have beds. So beds, beds is one thing, but if you don't have nurses to, to run the beds, it's, it's a problem. In some countries, and we, we, I, I focus now on the, on the intensive care beds, because in normal, for normal beds, uh, these, were, these were sufficient in, in, in all countries. So I look here, and the... The, 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 the line, the, the, usually the, or, the orange line here, is the pre-existing capacities. Capacity, the dotted line, is including the surge capacity in these four countries here, France, Portugal, the Netherlands, and Sweden. And the blue line is the number of, of ICU patients treated in these countries. And you see in these four countries, with Portugal just touching the pre-existing ICU bed levels, the surge capacity was necessary because more, at least at some point in time, usually during the second wave, Portugal during the, 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 the first wave, in Portugal during the second wave, the number of pre-existing ICU beds would not have been sufficient. So the surge capacity really proved to be necessary. In other countries, they did not utilize or did not need the surge capacity. And, we, and, and you see here in, in the, on the left-hand side, Finland, with the dark blue are the uh, ICU beds occupied by COVID patients, and the light blue are the, are the, other, are the other patients. Or Austria, on the, on the lower right-hand side, where the, they, they had a minimal surge capacity, but you see that the COVID patients were far from reaching the normal capacity. While in Belgium, maybe we hear a bit more that the surge capacity gave some flexibility and reassurance in, uh, in, in, when, when utilizing uh, the, uh, the, the ICU capacities. 
in my own country, and, and this is, this is uh, uh, Germany here since uh, over the last year from uh, roughly October 2020 to October 2021. And it starts only in summer last year because we didn't have a pre-existing uh, ICU register. And some of my ICU colleagues said we need, we need a register. They actually thought they were the first one to, in, to invent it initially. And I said, people, there are registers like that in, in other countries. So why don't you compare the purple area here are the occupied the occupied intensive care beds, you see around 20,000. The green ones are the free ones, and the, the blue line is the, uh, the, are, are the COVID patients on, on the ICU wards. But even in Germany, they talk about stretching the, the limit, reaching the, the, the limit, and some of you from other countries would say, what are they, what are they, they talking about when the blue line is, is what it is? Then you can add and we have added capacity, as, as, as I said, you can add the reserve capacity on top. The first thing now is you see that the overall volume, the overall numbers of, of, of beds is, is, is going down. And that's, uh, that's coming back to Joseph's in, initial question. Is masses of capacity, is this reassuring or is this inefficiency? And Germany found out that masses of capacity, if you don't have staff, is, is not, is not, re really, is not re really useful. And, 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 and we, we say you, you need you know, maximum two ICU beds uh, per, 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 per nurse. And then you see, wait a minute, if you calculate it, it doesn't, it doesn't add, add up. But, and this is the other side, I mean, many countries thought that the, that, that the differences in utilization are only, or at least mainly due to the infection numbers. And we know, all, but we know that the, that the treatment patterns differed a lot. This is during the first wave here, and this is a range of eight European countries. On the left-hand side, we see the percentage of infected people who were, who, who, who were hospitalized, and, and, and we see that differs greatly. In the first wave, 60 almost 60% of, of cases hospitalized in the Netherlands, only 10% in, 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 in Norway. And when you look at the length of stay, difference between 20 days, this is, this is all hospital days here, 20 days in France, eight days in the UK. And so when you then calculate the number of hospital days, per infected person during the first wave, it differed by a factor of nine, between 11 days on average in France and 1.3 days in, in Norway. When we do the same thing for intensive care, we, we saw in the first wave the same, the same difference, you know, the same magnitude. 5.4% of all infected people were sent to intensive care in the Netherlands or Germany but only 1.7% in Ireland. Lengths of stay on the ICU differ between 21 days in the UK and 12.8 days in Germany, again leading to a difference in, in, in the factor of ICU utilization per infected person of a factor of four between the Netherlands and Ireland. And then we saw you voted for the adaptive pathways. And so clearly countries got to know better uh, to, 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 to work on, on, on how, how to find better ways to keep out patients out of hospitals, to keep them in, into hospitals shorter, change the, the pathways. And so this one compares here the treatment, what we just saw, the first wave here with, with, with the different figures of people hospitalized between Denmark and France, factor of three, people of those hospitalized sent to ICU, varying by a factor of three, and then total people sent to, or pe total patients sent to ICU differed by a factor of three. Then over time, second half of 2020, 
one year after the first, first wave, we saw changes here, drastic changes in the percentage of people treated on, on ICU. It went down to, to one third, oh, you could say one third only, so still quite high in Germany or in Spain, up down to one eighth of the first wave in, in, in the UK. But you see also what has happened. We still see the differences. So, the learning from each other, everybody is learning within the country, but there's still room to learn from each other across borders. Why are things like this in one country and like that in another country? After all, it's the same disease. Within countries, and this was one of, this was the first one on, on, on the list there, within countries previously often unknown real-time measurement and reporting systems were developed, while it previously took, in many countries, including my own, up to two years to know how many people were hospitalized two years ago. I mean, this would be like you go to your, to your ATM machine and it tells you two years ago you had 10,000 euro in your account, and unfortunately, we don't know how much money you have, you have, have, have today. But again, Everybody is developing it, 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 its own system. They're all good systems, you could say, but why don't we learn more from each other? So in conclusions, I, I think we can say that European countries all reacted quickly to create surge capacity in response to feared hospital capacity shortages, which proved to be necessary in some especially those which relied on their hospitals instead of their primary care uh, system during the first wave. The reliance on the hospitals decreased during the following waves, but we still see these fourfold differences in hospitalization and ICU rates. While availability of timely data increased markedly, international learning from country experience could be improved and we hope that this is a good event here to, 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 to harness this, 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 this idea really and say, let's do this. And this would show that preparing for setting up, if we all learn from each other, and this was Joseph's question on Germany, this would show that preparing for setting up search capacity rapidly rather than maintaining high numbers is probably the better strategy. So if you have high numbers during normal peace times, creates to the problems of itself, which we always, always de debate. So we all need a plan how we can quickly set up search capacity, and therefore we need the good information center, information systems. But to do that better, we need to cooperate. Thank you. Brilliant. Stay. <laughs> that was absolutely perfect, as always, Reinhard. Beautiful illustration of these issues. Uh, Raja is also co-director of the Observatory with me. We have another co-director, Martin McKee, that says, has a campaign about measuring chairs in hospitals. Why not chairs? Why beds? Which is your point about whether bed is a good measure of capacity and so on. But there are two sets of questions. One I'm going to ask all of you. Why this healthcare variation we've been talking so much about keeps replicating itself again and again? Can I have some points in your chat for later on for debate that that, that Reinhardt can, can report. But on one, year, one million dollar question, uh, Reinhardt is an expert at the European level, and in, in Germany it is the, it's a pop of this area, I can say a scientific pop. What is your position about the spare capacity? How do you counter-argue this point in a moment that Germany goes around the world saying, we had a spare capacity and that's why we did so well with COVID? Well, I mean, we are back still, that you could say, in the old times when hospitals were really built around beds, when we put people with a myocardial infarction in bed, in bed and say, you rest for two weeks, either you survive or not. And so today, the, 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 the measurement of hospital activities is not primarily how many people are in beds, but how, how much techno technology you have, in this case, ventilators, but maybe for the next pandemic, we need, we need different technologies, and it is about staff. And I said, so the, the reassurance of having masses of beds is, is, is a false one. You need to do good plan. Could be that the next pandemic means that it is a kidney problem and we need to get quickly dialysis um, um, instruments. And, and, and so, and, and we, we need flexible ways. And I think that came also from, from, from the vote. Having masses of everything in stock 
but not even knowing how many ventilators you have indeed. is not really a good preparation. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Reinhardt. May I ask uh, Nick Fahi to join me now? Uh, Nick Fahi is a Group Director for Research on Health and Wellbeing at RAN Europe, uh, formerly in Oxford and also working with the observatory. I think I'm not exaggerating uh, because you did write a seminal piece saying that on digital health uh, tools used during the pandemic. And actually, you had a very successful summer school uh, this year on this subject. So give us a sense on that work, Nick, please. Thank you very much, Joseph. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my thanks also to the International Hospital Federation. Like you, Joseph, I, it's just such a pleasure to be out at a conference and having the opportunity to interact with uh, so many interesting people. And we've already had such interesting discussions during the, uh, the conference, and I'm hoping to contribute to them uh, during this presentation. So indeed, we wanted to look at this question of digital tools because Joseph alluded to it in his introduction. Uh, we've, we all know that digital health technologies have enormous potential to improve our health systems. And so we wanted to understand how these digital technologies have been used and how they have changed how health and been part of the health system response to the COVID pandemic. And that set out, uh, Joseph, you already advertised the range of the observatory's publications, but I'm just focusing on this particular one that I and my colleagues led on, as you said. Um, and I want to uh, thank in particular Gemma Williams, who isn't here, and the whole health system uh, response monitor network. Joseph has mentioned the function of the observatory. One of the strengths of the observatory is that it has country correspondence in every uh, country of the European region. And we drew on that in trying to generate some real-time uh, real analysis of what was going on across the different countries of Europe. And I'm gonna talk about those different aspects that you can see up on the screen in this presentation. And it's important to start with the context. And Digital health, e-health, m-health, now digital health, these have been topics where member states and, and countries across Europe have been trying to put in place strategies to support these tools for many, many years, but have found it very challenging to do that. We've seen wide variation both within and between countries, and it's tempting to think of these as technological challenges. But actually, and this I think is a theme throughout many of these points, these are primarily organizational, human system challenges. I'm borrowing up here from, there's a framework and implementation research called the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research by Dan Schroeder and colleagues. And here we're citing a particular table from Ross and colleagues about factors that influence the implementation of e-health. I don't expect you to read this or go through the detail of it. I just wanna highlight that the characteristics of the technology is just this first element. What you then see is it's the individuals who are involved and their attitudes, the setting where the technology is being implemented and the leadership, other factors involved, the outer setting, so the system as a whole and the process of implementation. So the technology itself is of course part of what influences adoption, but only part. And it's these wider organizational and system factors that make such a big difference. So what changed during the pandemic? What did we see? What we, the key change I would want to highlight is the, not so much a technological change, but an impetus, a motivation to make use of digital health. Because obviously there was this huge pressure to not be seeing patients physically in the same way. That was principally for initially for COVID-19, but also for other care. And so we saw this rapid and substantial shift towards remote care, particularly in primary care, but also in hospital care. And I'll come back to that in a moment. If you're thinking about doing this, do you just do the same care process, but now over remote provision? Well, initially, yes. But what we then saw was in different places shifts towards changing and adapting pathways, exactly as many of you selected uh, in the poll. So for example, rather than the GP saying, well, this patient needs input from a specialist, I send them to see the specialist in the hospital, you get platforms such as Consultant Connect in Oxford um, who enable the GP to then make a direct 
consultation of the specialist, in some instances, with the patient in their GP consulting room. And, of course, we saw more use of supporting devices, such as for home monitoring and diagnostics. And this was primarily a question of different use of existing tools. And I'm talking here about, obviously, the were new digital tools involved, uh, developed in particular for the monitoring and surveillance of COVID-19, for vaccination, and, and I should highlight, because it's been mentioned in both of the, by both of the previous speakers, there were new tools developed for the internal data processes, the consolidation and producing data about internal management of care much more quickly, as Reinhardt just illustrated. That was uh, a, a change. But in the provision of care, it was mostly about rethinking pathways and use of existing tools. And that raises a question. Because we think of a hospital as a physical place. But what the COVID pandemic showed was that hospitals were resources that provided care across a much broader range of places and through a much broader range of services than just the people who physically came to them. And this is, I think, a very familiar topic to many of you in, in the audience. We, you know, we've been rethinking again about this role of the hospital for many years. But we've really seen during the pandemic a large scale testing of different models and different roles of how this center of expertise and specialized facilities can be best used in a way that doesn't necessarily need to be so physically linked. What were the policy responses to this? Well, this in a sense reflects what the situation was of the system at the start of the pandemic. I said that different countries had taken very, had patchy responses and had, were in different stages. And in many ways, their policy responses reflected the challenges that they had to deal with. So for some systems, their policy responses were actually very limited because they didn't need to be. They had the tools in place and it was a question of using that environment to a greater extent. For other systems, it was much greater. It was things like enabling reimbursement for telemedicine for remote provision of care that wasn't allowed before. And we developed this structure of these four uh, types or these four pillars of, of policy response. So the regulatory and legal framework, financial mechanisms is, um, are different forms of care reimbursed. How are they paid for? Quality, we saw real attention to sharing training and learning. Reinhard was talking about a lack of learning between countries, but I think at a, at a clinical level, there was a lot of effort to try and develop ways of learning, in particular, how to respond to COVID as a disease within countries. Um, and technical standards, platforms, interoperability, tools, and there in particular, as we thinking again about this great developing platforms for much timelier, quicker sharing of data, administrative data within the system about capacities and abilities to respond. I can't talk about digital health solutions without talking about inequalities. Um, we found this to be a particularly helpful framework about the five A's of access for um, equity and technological access. And you can see those up there, I won't go through them. I think there's just one point I would want to make on this slide, which is we tend to think, or well, there is quite often a narrative about the use of digital health technologies, which focuses on age, um, which says that, well, it's all these older people, it's everybody's grandparents who have difficulty using digital health technologies. I don't know about you, the grandparents in my family, once they figured out that the way to talk to the rest of the family was by using Skype and FaceTime and Zoom, figured out technology just fine, thank you very much. Um, and this is reflected in the research evidence. What comes across from the evidence, such as it is, is that the key barriers are not about age, they're about socioeconomic status. It's much harder to use digital tools if you can't afford proper internet access, if you don't have the most recent devices or any devices at all. So what kind of change is happening? And my metaphor for this is, is this a, are we talking about a rubber band or a bicycle? Is this massive change in the use of digital health tools during the pandemic a band which has been stretched? But actually, as soon as that pressure of the pandemic goes, it's going to snap right back to where it was before? 
Or is this the bicycle? Is this the pandemic, the, the launch which gets it going and, and, keep, and gets that initial momentum in place and now it's going to be sustained? And building on that question, what can we do to make it more like a bicycle and less like a rubber band? And we, we put up some particular suggestions here about actively supporting, providing organizational support so that we don't just leave clinicians and managers to be uh, implementing and taking forward these processes, but we provide active support. That we address concerns. You know, a lot of clinicians and patients have legitimate fears about what are they losing, what are they missing by using digital health solutions. The limited evidence about this suggests actually care can be provided in very good quality ways through digital health solutions, but we need evidence to support that and back that up. And maybe we need to rethink the strategic role of hospitals within the system. So in conclusion, just to underline, what we've seen during the pandemic built on what we saw beforehand. We've seen a massive new impetus to use these tools, less, as Joseph, as you said in your introduction, less a question of new tools than a, a profound motivation and facilitation of using existing tools. Policy has been largely focused on facilitating those approaches, but now we're at a pivot point to see how much of this we sustain for the future. And we need to find ways of actively addressing the outstanding barriers and the concerns to keep this from being a temporary shift towards realizing the potential of digital health and a permanent sustainable improvement in the capacity and resilience of our systems in making best use of technology. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think it's really fair to say that you have given us a new perspective of the issue uh, in terms of transformation and so on. I suppose we go back to the famous Bill Clinton point saying it is the implementation, stupid. Although he said it's the economy, stupid. And I think that's, that's you made that very, very, very well today. Roland, I hope you'll invite us again because we've been saying what's a hospital, what's a bed. We are actually almost challenging all the foundations. <laughs> So that was brilliant. Uh, just very quickly as we need to move on, um, is it here to stay? Is it the band or the bicycle? I know you asked the question. Now, now I'll ask the question to you. Are you optimistic? You think that we can harness that? We can see this shift? Do you think particularly the culture of, of the profession in our part of the world has embraced it now? What is your sense, your gut, gut feeling? My, no, no evidence, gut feeling. Uh, my gut feeling is that the, the massive change that's happened is that people have now seen what is possible. But everyone has invented all sorts of things which they invented specifically as this was a solution in time of crisis. And they accept it as a solution in time of crisis. But if you go and talk to them, they still have concerns about, well, it's worked up until now, but... In particular, for example, this point about what am I missing when I don't have the patient here physically in front of me? Exactly. What do I not? And, and I really exactly. think that a big part of making this sustainable is about putting the support in place and using, we've got this giant natural experiment of what's happened during the pandemic. We've got to actively try and learn from it now and generate the evidence that shows us what we can do. You made the point really strongly and very well. Let me now invite Dimi Pantelli, Lead Innovation within the Observatory. A real pleasure to have you here today, uh, Dimi. Uh, Dimi is going to tackle an issue almost we've been advancing and talking a lot about, the human resources, how we support them, how we continue supporting them. Dimi. Thank you very much, uh, Giuseppe, and thank you also from my side to the IHF for having us and for having me here in Barcelona. Um, it is a pleasure uh, to be uh, in this wonderful city um, and actually see also all of you here and having had the chance to speak to some of you over the past few days and listen to you also present. I'll try to reflect um, during my presentation also on a couple of the things that I heard in other sessions related to the workforce. Um, as uh, Giuseppe mentioned, I will just look a little bit more um, in depth at a couple of the, of the innovations or the strategies that Giuseppe already mentioned in, in his menu when we started uh, the session today. And just to point out, as, as Nick did, that um, I have the, the honor of summarizing what we have found um, on these issues today, but this, is, this relies a lot um, on work done by a range of colleagues at the observatory and uh, especially our, our correspondents in the countries of the European region and my colleagues, Gemma Williams and Juliana Winkelmann. Um, so I, I'll just um, 
direct you back to the poll questions that we, that we had earlier today, remind you that two of them had to do with the workforce and the last time that I checked um, in the online app, uh, they together amounted to about 25% of all the answers. And given the range, the broad range of options that we had to vote on, this shows also quite clearly how important this, this issue is uh, for all of you, the same way that it is for us. So the main three uh, tenets that we have here um, to address the challenge of the COVID-19 pandemic, three main areas to look at when it comes to the workforce. First, how we scale up to ensure that we can actually deliver um, this dual delivery of services, both for COVID patients, but also ensuring that other patients um, receive the services they need. And we can do that by either increasing uh, the number of staff, increasing the capacities of the existing staff, or repurposing and reskilling, uh, we say, within the staff that we have. But if we put all this strain on our workforce, we also need to make sure, as we previously heard today and in different sessions, that we support the workforce in a way that makes that actually possible. So these last two on the, on the slide that you're seeing were in your poll, and as, as I said, about 25% of all answers. So if we think about the scaling up, uh, and for many of you, uh, this will be familiar, but we are taking the bird's eye view of, of, what, of what has been happening. And just to say, our evidence comes primarily from the European region, though not only. Um, so this is the, the bird's eye view from Europe, but also applicable internationally. Um, as I said, um, main two areas or ways to move forward is to either increase capacity among the existing workforce, and we'll see in, in a bit uh, a table of what the options are there, um, or uh, mobilize uh, and recruit additional personnel. Um, so we um, saw uh, that both of these things happen, requiring changes um, in legislation, regulatory change and national policies, but also um, initiatives at organizational level uh, and often initiatives from individual professionals. I'll come back with an example um, in, a few, in a few minutes. Um, and of course, if we do that, if we put, as I said, the extra strain, we need a clear, clear plan um, on supporting and we, we come back to that as well. So um, at the bottom right um, of the slide, you will see a collection. We won't go into all of that. Just to say that within the existing workforce, things like existing working hours uh, or st changing staffing requirements or canceling leave were observed. All of those make sense because we had a, 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 an emergency uh, situation, but at the same time put quite a bit of strain on the workforce. At the same time, also trying to increase the numbers by either um, increasing recruitment quotas or recruiting medical students, for example, in their final years, bringing back professionals who are already in pension, etc. Two of these, of these options of increasing the number of professionals have to do with also inviting and including professionals from other countries or asking other countries for help. And this is important from the European perspective, from, but also, of course, internationally. We'll look at that from the European perspective in a minute. Um, it is important because, of course, in order to do that, we need to be able to have a common understanding of what qualifications are available and are needed across countries to be able to work uh, jointly. So this is an additional uh, challenge of making these options happen, and I'll return to that in a bit. The second option, as I mentioned, is to um, use the workforce in a more flexible way. And we start with the examples here you see at the bottom of the slide where we have either physicians with other types of specialties coming in and assisting, but we also have professionals from other uh, professional groups such as physiotherapists and dentists with specific skills uh, being invited in to work in ICUs. And I'm sure um, we have also, we will hear from, from Mark and, and Lisa Maria, but also we have here in the audience many of you who had experience with these important changes um, and what it took to actually make them work. Um, this largely involved reskilling and repurposing doctors, nurses, and other health professionals, and really also focused on training, uh, because we needed clearly to impart the new skills. Um, and one of the, of the options um, in the poll as well looked at training and also the digital tools that were used in light of no presence uh, options. Um, and Nick uh, mentioned how that was also one of the main tenets of the contribution of digital healthcare without, throughout the pandemic. Also here, um, we look at these different levels of making that happen, starting from general policy direction to legislative change to regulatory change, but also organizational and professional, and, and, and professional initiative. And as we saw, especially in order to ensure that this goes smoothly uh, and training goes smoothly and the resulting skill mix is something that is desirable and understood, 
This required close collaboration with professional associations. I think Giuseppe alluded to that earlier today. What we've seen in the past is that there's quite a bit of, let's say, rigidity in changing the status quo. But what we saw in the pandemic was that this was clearly a call to arms for everyone. Um, and that obstacle was surpassed um, in many countries. So when I said that when, what, the two of the options for increasing the number of professionals looked at inviting professionals from other countries or inviting countries for help and uh, receiving support from professionals who were willing to travel. Clearly, for that to be possible, we need to look at what the qualifications are and what I, I'm just going, not going to go into detail. I'm just going to touch on this here. Our background thinking is that we have a range of steps within a professional's professional development and obtaining skills that are necessary to deliver care. And here we have a model that we created with team at, with team at the observatory that looks at doctors and nurses specifically, where we start with, let's say, admission requirements for, for um, the primary education, but then it goes all the way down to maintaining fitness to practice and making sure that if there are transgressions, those are reported. And it goes through basic education, through specialty training, through continuous education after um, obtaining the right to practice um, all the way down to potential uh, malpractice issues. And our uh, understanding of this from the European perspective is that while there is a lot of initiative and background for regulating the undergraduate education for the health professions, there is still a lot of room um, for support uh, for not standardization necessarily because we still want to enable um, innovation um, at different levels, but at least a harmonized understanding of what the different skills are. So what we say is that currently the EU framework, at least when we look at Europe um, in that respect, focuses on the automatic recognition of the primary education of physicians and nurses, but what the pandemic has shown us is that we need flexible, faster mechanisms for a range of, of other um, elements to be able to mobilize uh, professionals quickly from one country to another or from one context to another. So what we would like to see is new and flexible mechanisms to recognize specialty training, such as intensive or emergency care, a comparative documentation of new skills. So for those um, professionals who were retrained in the effort to rebalance the skill mix for delivering services throughout the pandemic, that they have a way um, documenting these new skills that is recognizable in other countries so that they can be accepted if they are willing to work there. Uh, we need also strengthened initiatives that uh, foster continuing education based on um, the extent possible common understanding of what the best options and approaches are. Um, and we need strengthened mechanism for cross-country sharing of information when there are reservations about the performance of individual professionals. Um, because, of course, if this is the case in one country, the other country who might be willing to receive this professional to work should be aware of that. And we also know from previous work with the observatory that we are not quite sure what the best regulatory format is across all those different levels of professional regulation to ensure that we actually make that happen. So what we would like to see, and in particular in Europe, using also EU funding for that purpose, and I return to that in a minute, um, is that we actually dedicate some funding to researching what is the best way to ensure that our professionals are trained to the best of their abilities and able to deliver care, also in emergency situations as we had in the COVID-19 pandemic. Another area where we saw um, collaboration and support internationally in the, in the European setting was this idea that during the need for upskilling and the need for imparting knowledge, for example, for working in ICU care, the initiative of individual professionals, this case in Belgium, was picked up with support from the EU, funding support, and provided virtual courses to train professionals with no experience in ICU to also cover ICU patients. I will take two more minutes, Giuseppe, if that's okay. My time is up for the 10, but I'll, I'll go to 12. Um, because one, the, the third pillar that we talked about is that we don't, we don't just need to increase somehow the capacity, the working hours, by either overextending our existing staff or adding. But since we're doing that, we need to actually make sure that we support this staff. And with our study um, on resilience and further work by colleagues, we see that there are different levels where we need to make sure that we actually provide support for our staff. And this starts with, for example, making sure that there is sufficient protective uh, equipment so that staff feel safe when they're performing their tasks. 
but also ensuring that there is support at the mental, for mental health. Um, the pandemic showed us how important that is, be that via hotlines or specific initiatives that are organized at the organizational level. We need financial compensation that recognizes the additional effort and the additional risk. Um, and we also need other practical support, like for example, childcare. And this is not just related to how much we can expect from our workforce during the crisis. It's also, for example, in terms of absenteeism, but it also relates to the attractiveness of these professions moving forward. Because as we heard previously, what the pandemic did was actually lay bare all the structural difficulties that individual health systems had. So if we, after many years of discussing how we need to strengthen the workforce, now have the cards in our hands to make it happen, then we need to make sure that it, it, those professions are and remain attractive so that we can attract new professionals and retain them going forward. So much for this. I will now also showcase an additional uh, piece of observatory work because it links directly to where we can get support to do all those things. To think about in a new way how we regulate health professionals. To think about what different options we have. Um, to also support uh, the workforce. We recently, together with Nick Fahi, uh, who spoke before me, and our colleague Nicole Maurer, we looked at the different tools that the EU provides for member states um, to improve their health and care systems. The, the arrow shows you the one program that is dedicated to health and its relative size compared to other uh, support programs that are not dedicated to health. Just to point out here the fact that one program is not funding program, not dedicated to, to health doesn't mean that you cannot actually use it to support health related initiatives. The point I want to make here, and I don't want to uh, burden you with all the different dimensions, um, is just to say there are a multitude of instruments that are related to hospitals that you can try um, to use to either modernize infrastructure, for example, regarding digital healthcare, or find new ways for, for engaging the workforce. And we can talk about that at, uh, later during the discussion, or you can take a look at our policy brief and reach out to us um, moving forward. My final points uh, summarizing, we saw many different solutions to search and support the workforce uh, implemented across countries. But we also saw here in this area as well, as previously mentioned, that Wave after wave, these changed and were adapted and were added to, depending on what we learned from previous waves. Um, rethinking how we regulate the professions is necessary um, for future preparedness, but also for peacetime. Um, and not least, in order to enable cross-country collaboration and cross-country learning, the importance of which, as we heard, is vast. And because we're talking about innovations in this session, I will leave you with the thought that cross-country learning, as Reinhard also pointed out, is an innovation in itself, and we need to harness it now more than ever. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, Dim, it is unfair to ask you to cover the whole support of the workforce, skill mix, upsurge, scale up in 10 minutes, so it's unfair. Thank you very much for managing so effectively. And, and Dimi wanted to make a point to share the amount of instruments and funds that are available to do that. So please take a look at, at that kind of work. Very briefly, Dimi, uh, as we're running out of time, partially is my fault, uh, gut feeling, like for Nick, gut feeling, is this to stay. We've been talking about the skill mix for years. We know that more, uh, there are ways to work together as teams much more effectively to shift, to shift tasks. You think that's the breakthrough? You think that the COVID will give us the breakthrough to really change the makeup, the way that we work together? I hope so. I, th I, I, th I think so, yeah. I think my answer, and it was a spoiler because you asked Nick the same question, so I had, I, I had a little bit of time to think about it in that sense. I think for some things, we saw it's possible and we saw it works well. So for example, when it comes to task, shif task shifting between physicians and nurses, I think there is, a lit there is momentum now to think, about this, to think about this again. I'm not sure if it's the same for some of the more extreme examples that we saw, like inviting dentists to come in and help with anesthesia, there may be not. But I think the, the idea is A, that we understand that the cohesion of the workforce as well is really important for preparedness times, but also that we see that solutions that worked well, and we need to, to, we need to I think, um, be frank and say we don't have enough distance yet to be able to evaluate that very well, but we have seen first things. I think for some of the things, I'm really hopeful that it is, yes. Good, a good notice, a good, a, good, a good way to wrap up with optimism. Last but not least, because the real protagonist is, protagonist is here, 
are, are the CEOs, Mark Knopin, CEO of UZ, uh, uh, UZ Brussels. How all that sounds? Don't say it's all pie in the sky, please. It's all these academics doing analysis. Well, but, but, you know, I'm preempting you here. I'm pushing you here. How all that sounds to you? I mean, you, you had really a tough, a tough job, like many of the people sitting yeah. with us, to implement all these changes to adapt. What are your reflections on that? Well, um, this is exactly what you asked me to do, to reflect on what I heard. So I didn't prepare for a presentation, but I took some notes and uh, I will react. I got seven minutes, I think, yeah. on, um, and reflect on, uh, to give you my re reaction as the CEO of a hospital. Um, my, first, my first remark is that, of course, we are talking about uh, managing the COVID ep epidemic coming upon us. But one of the things we didn't discuss about is that this came on top of the non-COVID uh, patients and pathologies that we normally take care of. So maybe for uh, a hospital manager, one of the most difficult things to organize in a very, very short time was the split of the hospital into two hospitals, a COVID hospital and a non-COVID hospital. A non-COVID hospital, by the way, in Belgium at least, for several weeks was closed between brackets for non-urgent care. So we had to redesign a lot of flows and processes within the hospital alongside increasing capacity, which was a second challenge. So that's something that we didn't discuss about, but maybe in on, on an organizational level was um, at least as difficult. Also because of this uh, let's say, a schizophrenic situation, uh, we had to manage a backlog of patients during the, 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 the slower COVID months that we have, because now we are witnessing a fourth wave in Belgium, so we are still start, we are again starting to postpone the non-COVID care. So that is something also that I, I take home uh, as, a, as something that I, that I learned. Uh, in the way, and by the way, now that I reflect on it, it might also be one of, one of the many reasons why there are so many differences between countries. Because I don't know if every country had, uh, had uh, st managed, or managed differently the non-COVID uh, pathologies, but that's something that should be discussed. By the way, I was impressed by the differences between countries. It's amazing. Now, uh, this COVID pandemic, uh, talking as the CEO again, was uh, and is uh, a lesson in change management. And therefore, uh, it's all about people. Um, that is one of the main things I learned, uh, managing a hospital of 4,000 people, is the quality that is in the house, uh, that an aligned workforce of 4,000 people has an incredible energy and power to move mountains, uh, the figure of speech. And what, what I used to say in, in my hospital is there is no I in team. There is no, there is no uh, you know, superman or superwoman doing things. It's everybody's role. And it's, it's property of everybody. And that is something that is very important. And I think the main reason why this uh, was, was possible in so many hospitals, uh, not only in Belgium, but across the world, is that it be, a hospital became a single purpose driven organization. Hospitals are complex adaptive systems. They have many, it's a complex environment, but during, especially uh, in the first wave, it switched overnight. It was Friday, March 6th at 1800 hours that we had our first patient, I still remember, and we switched in the weekend to a single purpose driven organization. And it's what is called in managerial uh, mumbo jumbo, you know, the purpose driven organization, etc. But this was the case, a purpose driven organization. Now, because it's all about people, it is a strength and it is a threat at the same time. Uh, a strength because uh, healthcare professionals are, and I think in, in almost in virtually every country, are really professional and know their jobs. But the threat is the people. We heard this morning the, the challenges of the sustainability in healthcare is threefold. It's workforce, workforce, and workforce. Uh, and I, I couldn't agree more that uh, points nine and ten there, or eight and nine in the poll, uh, together for 25% are for me the most important. Um, change management in times of, of COVID is, of course, crisis management. And crisis management is all about two things. 
it's about speed, and it's about trust. Michael Ryan is the chief exec of the WHO, and uh, in the beginning of COVID, he has issued a, a fantastic speech saying that speed trumps perfection, and perfection is the enemy of the good. You have to take decisions quickly. Then you make a lot of mistakes, which is not a problem as long as you recognize those mistakes and, and tackle them and don't do them again, uh, of course. And trust. Trust between all the stakeholders in the hospital, around the hospital, in the healthcare sector, but also in society. And I think I feel now that the fourth wave is coming upon us, at least in Belgium and in some other countries in Europe and the world, that the trust from society, from the public, is somewhat waning. There's a lot of distrust, especially also since the vaccination campaign started. There's a lot of fake news. And the role of the media and the, social, the mainstream media, but also the social media for me is crucial. It's something I learned. Uh, third, on innovation, COVID, of course, has been a, an, a, an enormous lever in implementing things that were already there. I refer to the former Minister of Health, Federal Minister of Health in Belgium in 2014. One of her 10 bullets was uh, telemedicine, you know, teleconsultations, etc. But until the first patient came, it wasn't applied because there was always somebody against it. Uh, it, it wasn't possible, it wasn't feasible, there was no regulation, there was no honorary, there was no fee, etc. Now, within two weeks, this has been resolved. And we switched in our hospital from zero consultations, zero teleconsultations, to about 1,500 teleconsultations per day during the time that the hospital was closed for non-COVID uh, care. Now, today, we still perform between two and 300 teleconsultations per day, and we have learned for which patient groups this is really the way to go forward and to keep. This is one of the keepers. Another thing was homeworking, because uh, we were obliged, uh, those who were needed at the bedside were obliged to work from home. And uh, from uh, also within a week or, or so, we went from 100 home workers to 1,200 home workers. We also keep this, and we now have permanently about 500 people working from home, and we have agreement with the syndicates, etc. There is a, reg a regulatory framework, there's a financial framework. This is also, also something to keep. And to, to conclude in innovation, something that I admire very much is what have been developed by engineers from our uh, engineering faculty and radiologists is an uh, algorithm, a CT algorithm, together with a number of hospitals and uh, an IT company, and it's been open sourced. So it's now available in 800 hospitals worldwide. And it's an algorithm based on low-dose CT scans with predictive, it's a, it's a learning algorithm. It becomes smarter with every patient included. And it's now used almost worldwide. Finally, COVID has also been a lever towards collaborative integrated care. Everybody talks about integrated care, in, uh, uh, at, but I, I never saw it working, at least in Belgium. And now, during the crisis, uh, we have worked together with the GP organizations, with the home care organizations, with the elderly care, residential homes, etc. Uh, and, uh, and between hospitals, by the way, which, is, which was also new, because hospitals were quite competitive, although we have hospital networks, etc. But for me also, this was, you know, um, if, if in times of crisis, the, the reflex is to work like this, it's probably the good reflex, and we should keep it. And now to conclude, because my seven minutes are over, um, I have seen enormous agility, flexibility, and quality within the healthcare sector across countries. And what remains to me to be proven is the stamina and the permanence of this resilience, because we will have to live with this virus for at least a couple of more years. And I refer there to the rubber band. Uh, can we, will it be stretched or will it be permanent? And one final um, remark is that uh, we have, for, I, I hope that memory is intact because we have forgotten about the Spanish flu in 1919. In Belgium, there uh, were 250,000 casualties in 1919 due to the Spanish flu. It's 10 times more than uh, the casualties from COVID. And that was the time of when my grandfather was a, was a young guy. And nobody talks about this. Nobody talked about it. We have forgotten. If you look at images from 1919, you see exactly the same as during confinement. 
uh, today. There's no difference, but we have forgotten. So I hope that our memory is intact and that we will remember the good things that came out of this crisis. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. You, you chimed beautifully uh, some of the lessons we heard, uh, bringing some reality, some uh, floor shop reality in a big hospital. Many points, trust in particular, in our study on resilience, trust has been one of the elements, the key elements of health systems resilience. Very, very, very briefly, the same question to some extent. The question of today, Mark, uh, can we harness this enthusiasm, this push of our workforce? We all agreed. We all like to say that. We all believe that. Can we, are we prepared for next one? We are there exhausted, mental problems. Mm -hmm. uh, they feel that we haven't compensated them that well, actually. After all, can well, we do that? Very quickly. Yeah, sec, 30 seconds, we have no please. choice. We will have to do it. And I don't think that financial compensation is the key to this. No, not a lot. It's maybe a short-term uh, you know, compensation thing. But that is not the reason, as I have witnessed, I'm a doctor myself, that, I, that is not the reason why people do what they do. So I do hope that we can keep the morale of the troops high. And by the way, I didn't touch it, but in our hospital, uh, the, the so-called fourth wave after, uh, after, after the uh, first wave is the, is the mental wave and the, the, the mental wellness and the mental well-being and also in, 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 in healthcare itself. Yes. The, 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 the mental health uh, is something that is not, talk, not talked about very much. But I do hope to, to be short and, and to give a short answer. I do hope that we can keep the morale high. And it's our, it's our um, responsibility as the managers of the hospital to do everything we can to make this happen. Indeed. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank I'd you. like to welcome now uh, another last but not least, indeed, the two protagonists here today are Mark and Lisa Maria Boipio who's going to be joining us uh, live. Thank you, live from uh, Helsinki. Lisa Maria, welcome. She is Director General, uh, Chief Medical Officer in Finland, and actually a medical doctor and in charge of intensive care unit in the past. So she has all the key elements we want today. Lisa Maria, your reflections as well, please. Thank you very much, uh, Josep, and apologies for not being able to join you physically in Barcelona. Uh, due to some uh, unexpected uh, coincidences. I put together a couple of slides because I sort of guessed that time will be short. Uh, can I have the next one? This is the title one, the next one. Yes, just a few reflections from Finland. Um, well, in the very first wave of the COVID-19 crisis, uh, Finland benefited uh, from its geographical position, uh, having maybe two extra weeks time to get prepared. And so we had the emergency legislation in, in power and we had quite strict restrictions during the first wave. So we never really were faced with such enormous pressure on our hospitals. But I will come back to that in just a, a few minutes. But first, a few uh, reflections on the theme of digital innovations. Well, digitalization of the health and social care provides uh, tremendously much data, technical data, metadata, quality data, and how do we make maximum use of that data during such a crisis? And I have to say that from the governance point of view and from the government's point of view, which during the first and second waves of the crisis had more powers on our healthcare system than we normally have, we were surprised, everybody was surprised to notice that we had significant shortcomings in the real-time monitoring of system performance, particularly in primary care and social services. We knew something, actually quite a lot about what was going on in our hospitals. But when it comes, came to the performance of the primary care and social services, we had to collect data basically by hand. So we need to find better ways to make use of the real world data in resource allocation and follow up of both COVID-19 and other services if we ever want to reach our strategic goals. Then when it comes to services, providing services, uh, teleconsultations were mentioned many time dur times during the previous presentations, has not been such a big issue in Finland because we already had that. I wouldn't say it's mainstream, but it's quite widely applied and it was more extensively applied 
But what was more remarkable was that digital tools became necessary to guide patient flows. So we had a pre-existing symptom evaluation tool available, which many hospital districts and communities had, had adopted, but not everybody was happy. And, and there was certain resistance towards that. But as soon as it was rapidly tailored to COVID-19 symptom evaluation, uh, there was a very, very rapid uptake of this pre-existing tool in most of our uh, hospital districts and by most healthcare providers. And it also was developed to provide direct booking for testing and later also for vaccination, so that improved efficiency and patient satisfaction enormously. And we have actually measured that by pulse. So uh, when Nick was uh, asking whether we have a sort of a bicycle here, I think we do have a bicycle. And we do have our customers, our patients on the driving seat because they won't go back to the previous telephone services. They want to have digital booking services and the tools that will allow them to uh, evaluate their symptoms in also other acute cases of just, uh, upper respiratory infections. But also we have to remember that there is such a thing as the digital divide. Applies to skills availability of the tools, but also to legal aspects. For example, who is using the digital tools for minors and so on? And we know that about 10% of the Finnish population will need assistance, and 10% of the population will never be able to use any digital tools for the health and social care needs. That is just the, the um, part of the population that we have to have the old fashioned services always available. Next slide, please. Now, the question of who manages resources across borders is, is a burning issue. And uh, in the Finnish health system, uh, that used to be extremely decentralized. I will show you one slide on the forthcoming reform uh, in just a, a couple of minutes. There was one healthcare sector that had always overcome any borders, and that was intensive care. Because the intensive care units in Finland had had a 20-year experience of a joint quality registry, and it was turned more or less overnight to be a COVID-19 coordination center. And as uh, Reinhard already showed, we have a daily access to the occupancy numbers in all the hospital districts and how many of the patients are, are COVID-19 patients, how many non-COVID patients we have, how many uh, spaces we have free, how many beds do we have free, and what is the staffing situation. Okay, as you can see from here, uh, the red uh, lines represent the COVID-19 patients. We never really uh, experienced a crisis in our ICU care, to be honest. Uh, it was tough, it has not been easy, and during the fourth wave, I agree that it is more question of resilience of the staff and us all in the mental sense. But still, we were able to, to convince our politicians that we do have escalation plans. They are extremely important that we do have reliable escalation plans that should the situation get worse. Uh, we have a plan how to cope with that, how to tailor down, down elective surgery and so on. We had some days, some weeks when we had to postpone elective surgery, but mostly we could manage with the resources that we normally have uh, if we were able to uh, flexibly uh, change the nursing uh, staff from, emerg uh, from emergency rooms and operating rooms to ICUs if there was a temporary crowded situation in the ICU. So next slide, just briefly in the interest of time, I won't go into the details of the reform. If I can have the next slide, please. So I think that the COVID-19 crisis has been a stress test, note added in proof that from a decentralized system with quite a lot of elements of competition, we need to collect our forces. Nobody can cope in a situation like the COVID-19 crisis alone. The hospitals are an, an essential part of the health and social care system, but they are just centers of expertise 
there is other kind of expertise in our primary health care, in our public health workforce, in our social care workforce, and we need to work together. And I think that that is really note added improve that we need to collect them all under the same management, the same budget, the same governance. And if I may say also the significance of the central government's uh, role um, in, in providing the data to the politicians has been highlighted by the COVID-19 crisis. In the interest of time, I will stop here. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Lisa Maria. Thanks a lot, Lisa Maria. Uh, it's exactly what we needed. I'm sorry we are a bit pressed and we ask you to high, high, high objectives with very little time. Uh, but exactly what we needed, a very practical, clear uh, application of these digital tools for monitoring, for monitoring vets, for remote consultations. That's absolutely perfect. Lisa Maria, very briefly, you have had a bicycle for a while. Uh, it's been working and that's why it's worked so well and it's part of the success with, your, uh, with your, the way you tackle the pandemic. What is it, Lisa Maria, very briefly, is it, is it the culture, is it the society that accepts these tools? Is it the patients, is it the citizenry that accepts these tools? Is it the professions that are used to use these tools? I know you were saying it could be done better, but there's something we need to learn about the, from the Finns. What is it? Because within Europe, you're really leading, leading the pack. I I think it's the culture. It is the culture which is shared by, by the public, by the patients, uh, by the um, healthcare managers, by our professionals and by our politicians. It is absolutely necessary that we have an ongoing dialogue between all these stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Let me call Gemma Williams, research fellow in the observatory, who's been, is going to be summarizing your main questions and then we'll do a, a, a wrap up with questions with each one of the panelists, including Lisa Maria, on, on the response to these questions. I'll try to distribute them a tiny bit. So I would like to have a wrap up with your final reflections and answering to these questions. Uh, Ronald, uh, if you give me another 10 minutes, because we started late, or five minutes, just to compensate. And so that way we get to hear what uh, our audience, our participants are saying today. And, and we hear one final round from our panelists. Gemma, I hope you are online. And you'll be able to summarize what's coming uh, in. Ah, there you are. Gemma, what is our colleague saying today? Yeah, good afternoon, Joseph, and good afternoon, panelists. And this was a fascinating session. I really enjoyed all the presentations. And the audience seems to enjoyed it very much, too, because we've had lots of questions come through. Um, and I think lots of them actually touched on what you just asked Lisa Maria, sort of in terms of what do we really think are going to be the sort of the drivers of whether digital health innovation stay? So will it be a sort of, uh, Darian Harris sums it up to the proverbial head. So the system design processes, et cetera, or will it be the heart? So the consumers and the provider preferences. So this is something that a lot of people have sort of reflected on. Um, and sort of related to that, and I think Nick and Dimmy perhaps might be able to reflect on this point, which is what sort of active strategies and support do we have to put in place uh, to make sure clinicians want to use digital health and to make sure they don't see it as a second best solution? Uh, then we had reflection on uh, Reinhardt's presentation in terms of the variation in terms of the average length of stay in ICUs and to what extent that was linked to efficiency issues. Um, and then something else that came up uh, from a couple of people was the, was the emergence of long COVID. Um, and this perhaps doesn't fit into, into sort of existing clinical specialties and so how might the emergence of long COVID affect the organization delivery? We have a so small problem. You, oh, that's finished. Okay. That's well, really... That's, that's for now. I recognize we're time constraints. <laughs> that's impressive the way you managed to summarize all that. Thank you very much indeed, Gemma. Uh, okay, we have very clear questions, one to Nick, about how we sell that to the patients. Let's, let's just start with you then. Then we'll go into the efficiency elements of um, uh, on bed uh, with Reinhardt. Uh, then uh, for you, Mark, uh, perhaps this idea of the long, long COVID. And with Lisa Maria, uh, with Dimi, perhaps you want to add to, uh, 
not only to sell into the patients, but to sell it to the professionals. So sell patients, sell professionals, efficiency. Mark, anything you want to add, but perhaps the long COVID, are you ready in your hospital for long-term COVID? And, <laughs> just a second, and then Lisa Maria, the difficult for you, the difficult one for you, you're the boss, you're the chief medical officer, general, general director. Why are you gonna put the limited text, the limited resources that we get into, into getting this hospital innovation going? As it is a difficult one, we'll keep you for then. So quickly, let's start uh, maybe with Reinhardt on, on, the, on the efficiency question. I'll follow that order. Okay, I hope that the microphone uh, works. Um, I think the surprising thing is that we now, that we saw originally in the first wave that some countries did not behave like we know that they should behave based on other, other pathologies, acute myocardial infarction and so on, where we know about these differences. And then, but now in the second, third, fourth wave, it becomes more and more clear that we have the same variation in, in utilization, both in the percentage of patients being hospitalized or, or sent to ICU and in the length of stay. And I think as researchers, but as policymakers, we are still puzzled. Everybody says, for example, in intensive care, they need intensive care. But the same patient would not be sent to intensive care if he were ill in, in a different country. And I think, so COVID, with all the things we say we have all learned, it adds to the point that, that comparability, both for researchers, for policymakers, but clearly also the clinicians in going back to their guidelines, that this is still on our task list. Absolutely. If there's a lesson today, is this one. This is not new. Since I know who I am, we've been looking at healthcare variation, we've been looking at high lines, we've been looking at best practice, and still we have these enormous variations. I think that's a real waste, a waste of public resources. It's something hospital managers, doctors should take at the heart. And it comes really about transformation, my dear uh -huh. friend Nick. It's all uh -huh. about how we sell it, and to Dimi, how we sell it to doctors, how we sell it to patients. But your question was on patients, Nick. Um, and, and, uh, and my thanks also to, uh, to Gemma as well for the, for the framing of those questions. Um, and so the answer, you, you don't sell to patients. If you want, the more you want to sell something to patients, <laughs> the answer is involve patients. The key to this, and, and Gemma might want to say something similar for professionals. If you want people, I think, and Lisa Maria, already alluded to this, I think part of the reason that Lisa Maria gave for the successful culture in Finland was dialogue and engagement. So if you want patients, and when I, you know, the research I do, when I talk to patients and we talk about different platforms and different means of providing services, patients aren't holding the system back. Patients want the system to move forward. They expect a greater variety of, of tools and mechanisms of access. That's not where the barrier is. It, might not be exactly the right thing that they need in meeting what they want. And that's a message of, of engagement and involving patients in this process. And that's crucial. But as Lisa Maria also always said, the fact that some, it won't always suit all patients. And so whatever we do, we have to also remember to have a variety of tools and channels that meet the needs of our different patient groups. And then the final thing, I'm, I'm quoting all my fellow panelists here, yeah? so this isn't my answer, this is a collage of their answers. I'm also gonna quote Mark, you know, if it's a change process, change processes are about people. So the answer to is it head or heart is it's heart. You need the head, you need the structures, you need the framework that enables it, but the framework just enables it. If you wanna make it happen, you need to bring the people who are involved in the change to be engaged in that change process. And a lot of that applies, as you'll say, Dimi, I'm sure, on, on, on the professionals. You are, uh, without exaggerating, an authority in HTA. You've been looking at health technology assessment uh, in various studies and so on. But still, all these guidelines don't reach our, our clinicians. They just don't own them, maybe. Why is it? I mean, it's digital here and it's guidelines all at once. Address it whatever way you want. How do we get the professionals adopting digital adopting guidelines? I know it's a difficult question. It, it is a difficult question, and I think Nick covered, and Mark earlier covered a, a big part of it, I think, involvement, co-creation, the system is the people, all of that applies. I think we saw with the health technology assessment regulation for the past three years, we've been discussing how we can do it at European level. 
there is still quite a way to go in understanding how we can work together. I think that we have to work together is even clearer now than it was before. The, the, the question is how we, how we actually do that. And I think involvement um, of all the important stakeholders in the whole process is actually really, really important. And uh, starting with Any sticks? sessions like we this. We always talk about and courage and involvement. Any sticks? Come on. Um, well, I think, I'll, I'll I think, Mark, I think Mark wants to talk about the sticks, but let, let me just build one bridge to the sticks that Mark will talk about. We, uh, we had the summer school this year on digital health earlier, and, and we heard it earlier from Mark that the one key element for everything is trust. So we need for, for the patients to take up digital health tools, for the professionals to take health, up digital health tools, for the patients to know that the, the workforce planning and skill make actually reflects their needs for long COVID going forward. And I think probably this is the answer and that goes hand in hand with transparency. So the two T's, trust and transparency. And the sticks would be probably on that side as well. So over to Mark for that. Yeah, Mark, on the trust, yes. on the sticks, yes. and on the long uh, COVID, uh, yeah. chronic COVID, very quickly. Be before please. going to long COVID, just to add something, we did a survey with our 400 doctors on daily consultation. Half of them don't like it. They just don't like it. They, they like to see patients, talk to patients. You know, the, uh, the, the, hidden, the hidden messages from uh, body language, etc. the little details, the nuances, etc. cetera. And, and just to be blunt, 50% of them, they don't like it. So unless they are forced to do it, for instance, because, uh, because of a lockdown or something, uh, they, they are not keen to, on doing it, except for a subgroup of patients. Patients they know, patients who are in the control with chronic disease and with parameters that they know from telemonitoring, etc. There, that's perfect. But, you know, it's not, it's not the magic solution, I think. But having said that, I had to say something about long COVID. <clears throat> that, that, that's a container definition, uh, because we, we don't have enough uh, experience yet uh, to know what is really going on. Uh, but uh, data that I know is that, pending the author, between 50 and 30 percent of COVID patients would have some form of permanent damage, be it in the uh, in immunology system or in the, in the lungs. Uh, we have followed 500 of our patients. Uh, uh, with repetitive uh, pulmonary function test, and 15% of them have permanent lung damage. Uh, but that, that goes also for cardiac for, uh, and other system failures that might have been the case of those patients, or post-ICU syndrome, which already exists and which we know, yeah. uh, and which maybe is independent of COVID. So for the moment, I would say it's a container, um, it's a container definition, and we need more uh, follow-up uh, to know exactly what's going on, I think. Perfect. Thank you very much for these reflections. Lisa Maria, can I ask you to wrap us up today, to conclude us today with some final reflections? As I said earlier, you have this uh, beautiful position of being, being a doctor, being there, practicing, managing hospitals, being chief medical officer. So you have a, a very important perspective here. Any reflections, and particularly the reflection I'd like to ask you, where do we put our limited resources in all these areas of innovations? Well, you are in charge anyway to do that. You don't have to tell us what you do in Finland, but what would be the, pl the place, the areas where you want to put your limited resources to on these innovations at hospital level? Well, innovations on the hospital level, I, I heard the question like, where would I put my money? And I, I prepared an answer to that, so maybe it's it's fit for purpose, but in any case, I would put my money in our workforce, particularly our nursing health workforce. Uh, their training, their volume, to be honest, also their salary levels, what kind of working hours, working conditions they have. So this is an issue that has really been brought into focus by the COVID-19 crisis. has been there before, but I think that that's heavily debated in Finland right now, and it needs attention. The other sort of uh, where I would put my money is the backlogs that have been created, but they are not primarily in the hospital sector. They are in the primary care and in the social care, particularly in mental care in its widest sense. So that's where I put my money and I would also make maximum use of digital tools, particularly in mental care, because that lowers the threshold for many people to, to for example, access to therapy. Over. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Lisa Maria. That was, I think, I think you could see there's a clear echo uh, on, on, on this final uh, suggestions of where to put the money. Nothing else from me. 
Apologies for running a bit late, uh, but really, please join me to thank these stupendous, wonderful panelists. I couldn't dare to, to cut them because what they were presenting was so useful, so helpful. I hope, uh, Ronald, you agree with that, and uh, we'll have more opportunity to work with all of you together in future. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you from all of us. Thank you.